My name is Paul. I'm from a lovely company called Cross Knowledge. We're just behind there. Come and see us if I don't annoy you in the next 26 minutes. We live in a global world. You all know this. I'm going to tell you a lot of things that you all know. It's a good, comforting thing to experience, isn't it? You're sitting there and somebody says, gosh, he looks like he knows what he's talking about, and I agree with everything he says. That makes me feel really clever. Hopefully that's what's going to happen. We live in a global world that tells you many things. Two pictures of a polluted river here in China, 25 years apart, tell you that in the next 10 years, the companies that are going to run the world, we don't even know their names. We don't know who they are. You've heard the numbers, 2005, the number of top 500 companies in the BRICS were what? 19? 2014? 75 of them. Where do they come from? What are they doing? Stuff we've never even thought about yet. Who are these people? The global leaders of tomorrow are not going to be European. Of that much, we're pretty sure. They're also not going to be doing more with less or tightening their belts or optimizing their business processes. What they are going to be doing is aggressively finding, recruiting, retaining, engaging with new people. They're going to be busy transferring critical skills. They're going to be creating a learning culture. Oh, no, they're not. They're going to be trying to ride a tiger of the learning culture that already exists within their organization, racing after the organization that they're trying to support as that organization races after the market that it's found itself in that is constantly changing. That's what they're going to be doing. They're not in the business of HR optimization. No, they're not. They, and cross-knowledge, one likes to think, we're really in the business of organizational transformation at speed. My mission to my message to, do, to you today is very, very simple. It's try and focus on what makes learners learn because that lets you change. Does that make sense? Nod your heads. Focus on what makes learners learn. How do you then react to the words learning management system? Learning management system. If you don't know what it is, you're in the wrong show. Learning management system. How any words? I think of rust, clunk, pain, but then again, that's mostly because my beloved Nissan just gave up the ghost. So I had to take it to the scrapyard. I'm thinking rust. Am I, am I on the right track here? You think of an LMS. It's a big, clunky, old transactional system with buttons that nobody likes. So I think perhaps we have to be moving from the traditional learning management system to a backbone of a learning organization. So I'm going to talk and show you a little bit about what Cross Knowledge does, because that's what I've got to show. I'm going to try, I'm going to do my very best not to make this a sales pitch. I'm not the sales guy, I'm the, the consulting director. So I spend all of my time with my customers. But if you really want me to, I'll pick your pockets later so you can sort of line up down here. So I'm going to show you a little bit about what we do and how we are inspired to try and create answers to organizations who want to move quickly and to try and help them move quickly and to change using learning technologies. That's why we're all here. So most learning management systems are, you got a pound coin, you go up to your Coca-Cola machine, you put a penny in the slot, push the button, out comes your product. It's a content distribution device, isn't it? You push the button, out it comes, job done. That's fine, but for it to actually be effective, it really has to be the learner experience that matters, no? Stick some content on a website, hope, sit back and watch as Rome burns in front of you as you fiddle wondering why nobody's using it. Push the door marked pull and find out again why nobody's using this. Because in reality, what you want to be doing is not just pushing stuff out and prescribing what people need to be doing, but allowing free access, allowing a degree of liberty, engagement, improvisation, creativity around people's self-directedness in their learning lives. Move away from this whole idea that learning happens one thing at a time to being a lifelong process. I could have done ballet as a kid, you know that? 
a lifelong process. 1885, we discovered, a lovely man called Hans Ebbinghaus discovered in 1885 that process, event-driven learning, one thing at a time, didn't work. 1885, and we're still thinking that one e-learning course, one three-day session is going to change anybody's behavior. Anybody, when's the last time anybody went on a classroom course? Within the last six months? Yeah? Last six months, you went on a classroom course. 1885, we've known this. Stop doing it. It doesn't work. It has to be a process. It has to involve repetition, reinforcement, reflection, reignition, recognition, and it really isn't news. Compliance, anybody have to deliver compliance training? You raised your hand there with a resignation. I have to do compliance training. Anybody have to actually take compliance training on the other side of the coin, yeah? Fun, isn't it? Why are we forcing people to do this stuff? If you have this wonderful captive audience, of mandatory compliance training. Why aren't you actually making it fun? Fun compliance training. Why don't you get people to be engaged with the learning that they have in front of them? Because then there's a damn sight better chance that they'll actually learn the things that will keep them safe and your organizations safe. And as learning professionals, as I am assuming very many of you are, Mightn't they not come to you and say, gosh, that was fun. Can I have some more, please? Formalities, classrooms, e-learning, virtual. This is all the formal stuff that you find out and about. What we need more of is the stuff that fits in the big 90% bucket of the 70-20-10 model. This informal stuff. It's like the work-life balance that doesn't exist anymore. I have two small children. There is no work-life balance. It's a work-life integration. I think it's also a work-learn integration. Isn't learning just something that should be a little invisible jacket you put on as you sit down at your desks every day? We take lots and lots and lots of bits of learning activities and whack them all together and call it a learning journeys, and it's not because we haven't glued them together. Or if we do glue them together, it's a next button that's gluing them together, and that doesn't count as glue because it's not very sticky. What you really want to have is something that is related, a journey that is pedagogically designed. The content itself can be beautifully designed by one of these many wonderful people around here, including yourselves, but it doesn't matter a damn if the journey isn't pedagogically designed as well. In fact, let's not have the discussion that pedagogy is the wrong word. It should really be andragogy. Thank you. I know that doesn't mean wearing women's clothing. So it's... You want to be able to create adaptive learning paths that are personalized for individuals. You get 10,000 people at GDF Suez, we do this. 10,000 people at GDF Suez, new learning, new learning for new managers. Are all those 10,000 people the same? Of course they're not. How do you create a learning journey that gives every single one of them their own experience, meeting their own values, their own needs, and their own cultural context, and by the way, in each one of their own 16 languages? How do you do that? You use new learning technologies and you create a full blend of learning that answers those needs. In my dream, it should be a joy to build this stuff. In my dream, it shouldn't be the L&D chaps and chaps as that sit there and plug away in these god-awful systems trying to build learning journeys, learning paths, communities, stuff like that. It should be anybody who can get out and build this. It should be a joy to design, to build, to create, to share. The easier it is, the, the happier you are at doing it, the more likely you are, you are to do it more often. Doesn't happen in your office all the time, does it? Mostly, yes, it does. Yes, people mostly do most of the learning, especially e-learning at their desks. It's mobile, of course it is. But I think it's more about the less about the device and more about how you use the device. It's more about, again, taking that learning to the learners, giving them what they need where they are. Working out what makes learners learn and doing that thing more often. Back to the old LMS. It's a system. But take that, break it apart, and bring the learning to the people where they use, whatever they use, whenever they use it. Just as a straw poll, who has in their organization a corporate social network? 
That's most of you. That's most of you have a corporate social network. Are you using it for learning? That's not most of you. Okay? But some of you, very interesting. I'll pick your brains later. You've got this tool, a sharing platform of some description. Use it to share. That's where people spend a lot of their time because that's where their pals are. That's why Facebook is popular because that's where your pals are. Put your learning where your learners are. Go to where they are. Don't make them come to you. Do you have a skills development matrix, learn leadership framework, learning organizational design, or something similar? Yes? Is it up to date? No. Why is it not up to date? Because your organizations are messy, organic, constantly changing. It's like trying, as an economist, it's like trying to map the global economy in an Excel spreadsheet. The only real map of that sort of organization is the organization itself. So. I'm very inspired, dubious, but inspired, cynical, but inspired by the LinkedIn uh, process where you can give people skills. You know, you've, you've seen it. You know the one? You give them the skill sets that uh, you think they have. Now, I've got quite a few contacts, and I honestly don't know all of them that well. It's remarkably accurate. Maybe give the people in your organization, the opportunity to start mapping and designing the skills that they think they need. So that means, perhaps, that what we all need to do is move away from this LMS and move towards an LES, a learner experience system. It's kind of the same thing as you've seen in the, MIT, uh, the Harvard, MIT, edX, MOOCs, those systems that have been designed from the ground up by ergonomists, business intelligence experts, specialists in statistical analysis, not having the developers in charge, but by having people who know what learners want and know how to make learners learn, have them be in charge. What will make the learner learn? So, what is your experience of most learning platforms? Good, bad, or indifferent? Indifferent, I would say. There are so many wonderful user experiences out there. It all just blends into one. So I'm, I said at the beginning, I'm going to talk about what we've got. And this is my context. This is my experience. So I'm just going to share that with you. So for us as an organization, Cross Knowledge is an organization, user experience is a, is a key competitive advantage for us. And I think if you translate that for our customers, it's a key competitive advantage for them. Their learners, their staff, have to have a simple user experience in their daily life. If their life is full of many different, different, many different and difficult systems to use, it compounds the hardship that they face in, a daily, in their daily lives. Their jobs are already hard enough. Why make them enter their time in two different places kind of thing? Why make them use a system? Why make them go to this system over here to log on, get your password, come over here, enter it three times, fail, call up the hotline? Do you know what I'm talking about? So user experience. What does that mean? Well, today, let's have a wee look. I'm going to show you some of the systems we have. It's what I have to share. I think is a good start. We have a fairly robust uh, platform. It's got about 5 million learners, lots and lots of third-party APIs. Uh, L'Oreal, they call us sexy but dependable. They're ideal man, which I think is not too bad. So what you've got here is it's a gorgeous on-message place, a profile, easy for the learner to come in and use. And then how do we get them to come there in the first place? We do smart learner marketing again. A gorgeous, simple email. Click a magic button. You're straight into the content. Learner marketing is a big thing to do when you're trying to engage people. Use every tool at your disposal. It's not a, there's no magic bullet that will do it one off. Use uh, multi, multimodal marketing campaigns to get, you, get your message across. Back to the idea of making it a joy for people to create content. If it's a joy for your L&D types to build material, they are more likely to do it. They are more likely to create inspiring material for your organization. If it's a chore for them, they are less likely to. Nobody's shaking their heads. It is fairly simple. If it's nice and easy to use, people will use it. 
If it's a pig, nobody will use it. Don't buy a pig, buy something nice and easy. You get my point? Easy like a Sunday morning. So in the near future, with that as a starting point, take that profiled learning portal idea further. We've got a little virtual coach here. Because you did this and you liked it, here's something else. It's a stage further than Amazon. Today, you go into Amazon, you want to buy a book. Other people who bought this will also like. That's fine. You haven't read the book yet. Because you did this, passed it, and liked it, you might also like the following things. So a virtual coach recommending material to you. A dynamic user interface, something that changes as you progress through your journey. See the little sunshine up there? If you fall behind, you get a little rain cloud. It's sad. Bit of peer pressure as well. My colleagues are also doing. Nothing wrong with that. Carrot, stick. Back to the corporate social network thing. In the systems we have, and many of the systems you'll see today, technically you can easily share stuff with other people. Why can't you copy and paste the URL into your corporate social network, Yammer, Facebook, email? Why can't I send it to my mom? I think she might like this. Why can't I do that? Why am I restricted from changing the way that my organization, my community, my family life works by a dodgy licensing model? Why can't I just share? You've got to have an app, right? Everybody's got an app. Track, change, assess, learn. You've got to start on mobile, finish on your desktop. Mobile not necessarily meaning on your phone. There's only a few things you can legitimately do on your phone. Really, devices are used differently. You use your iPad sitting back like that, don't you? Your thumbs up. You use your phone hunched down in the tube like this. Different, different ways of interacting with different devices. Give people what they need. Are you learn? Oops. Yes. What sort of learning intelligence do you need? Now, learning intelligence I define as really being kind of business analytics. It's um, time to competence. It's analytics around enterprise competencies, understanding who's benefiting from the training activities that you're delivering. It's not necessarily big data. It's not. It's more just big thought. It's big analytics. It's using the data that we already have. And we have tons of it, don't we? Lots and lots of material out there. So that material is generated from the different learning formats you have available. We get three main ones. There's uh, this, which is a blended learning format. Adaptive learning here. So you've got, you start there, you get a question. It defines what you're going to do in the next stages. This personalizes your learning journey for you. 10,000 people, GDF Suez, the story in point. None of the 10,000 had the same learning journey. Ish. A community of practice where you can share, rank, rates, collaborate with like-minded people in similar positions. That was the push. This is the pool. You get both working together. And then for others, you have a personalized experience where some one individual will lead you personally through a learning journey. This gives you about 20 hours of learning, coached, face-to-face, -face, mentored learning online. Just another learning format, another learning experience to add to your mix, to keep the diversity, to, to keep the engagement going with your learners. And then, of course, that does generate a lot of data. For your managers, do you want horrible pivot tables or do you want something pretty and easy to use that they can drill down on, makes a lot of sense? What's going on? What's not going on? So in the not too distant future, building on that, what we want to then do is to see more learning interactions, more learning intervention types, everything you can possibly imagine gathered together. We already, you've already seen, I'm sure, you can pull in YouTubes and TED Talks and content from us, them and everybody, content you've built yourselves. How easy can we make that happen? I'll show you. Pulling in lots and lots of different types of virtual classroom is important as well. But then, starting with the idea of learner motivation and engagement, I like badges. I think they're going to be quite fun. 
I did a degree at the University of Edinburgh. I have a master's degree in Scandinavian studies for my sins. It's like having a degree in chocolate modeling. It's really nice and really pretty, but damn all use. I'm a big cynic when it comes to university educations, I'm afraid. I love the idea of badges. They make my fingers tingle. They're a replacement, I think, for certificates, a replacement, perhaps, for diplomas, a replacement, perhaps, for degrees, if you're a real heretic. But what do you do with them? Where do you put them? Do you share them? How do you share them? Whose rules do you follow? What we're trying to do here is maybe make something obsolete, maybe generate a new learning goal, a new learning vision. Maybe letting people self-set their own objectives, having your virtual coach recommending new things, having more control over what's going on. But the challenge I think we have yet to face is how do you really make that valuable? This is mine. You've all got one, I'm sure. Most people here are probably on LinkedIn. This is mine. Um, I'm honestly not a convert, and I do very rarely reciprocate, but this is essentially a weighted list of what the however many thousand or so people I have in my contacts think what I do. And it's remarkably accurate. Scares the bejesus out of me sometimes. It's remarkably accurate. That, I think, inspires us. It's something we can learn from, share to, maybe make permanent my badge of learning. So, how big and scalable, the third prong here, how big and scalable does this stuff need to be? I think scalability, do you need a system for 20 people, 200 people, 2,000, 200,000, 2 million? We get 5 million learners, it's pretty damn scalable. So uh, I think like, like good accessibility. You go to a hotel and you find the handle in the hotel bathroom and you help, it helps you get into the bath. Do you use it? Probably. Do you have one at home? Probably not. Would you put one in? It's these things that make everybody's lives easier. This scalability, robustness, size, makes everybody's lives easier. If you're faster and more reliable for 200,000 people, you can be faster and more reliable for 20. That's my point. So then from that, scalability and industrialization has to be interoperability. How many LMSs do you have? Hands up if you only have the one. Two, three, four. Okay, we maxed out at four. Four LMSs. Do you get them all to talk together? Can you launch your content in your sum total that tracks back to your SAP HR that then can also push it out to the Saba guys? The Saba guys are in France, but they're not used in South Africa because South Africa is running Moodle. And who's talking to whom and where's that reporting going from? <gasps> oh, boy. Well, pull it all together. Everything has to talk together. Point buying, best of breed buying is what we are seeing more and more often. Being able to pull in all sorts of material. As much as I would dearly love you all to buy from Cross Knowledge our catalog of 17,000 learning objects from leadership, management, and personal development, written by 75 of the world's best authors from the 20 top business schools, I know it's not going to happen. But what it means is that you can pull in different catalogs from different places. It should be that easy. Going back to the point, if it's not easy, it won't happen. We have tracked on those customers who need a login box, their username and password, 50 percent, five zero percent of people stop at that point. Fifty percent. And we have five million active learners. I'm not quite sure that means we have 10 million real ones, but we've actually got five million active. So 50 percent of people who come to hit our, pla our platform where we do not have single sign-on, easy integration in place, drop out at the login box. Please don't use it don't have one. Would you all use Twitter? Facebook? Facebook? Yeah, Facebook. Would you use it if you had to log in every time? No. Why would you expect your learners to do that? Tons of different contents out there. Being able to create your own is important. Pulling in lots of different types of video is important. Having the system do all the heavy lifting for you is important. Integrating with everything in, on the planet is important making your learners' lives as easy as possible, using technology to take away the pain 
rather than add to it. Take away the pain of recording a headshot, shoving it up on your website. Take it away. Don't add to that pain. Industrial learner marketing. If you're from Asia, you'll see these things everywhere. We're starting to see them more and more, the QR codes. Oh, that's interesting. Flash instantly enrolled in the course. Click instantly enrolled in the course, just like that. Two pictures of the polluted river in Shanghai and China, 25 years apart. I think Shanghai's response to their changing business environment was to build hundreds of skyscrapers and cover thousands of acres of their countryside in concrete. That's their response to their changing environment. That's what they learned. But it isn't the strongest of the species that survives. Neither is it the fastest. It's the one that's most responsive to change. And how do you respond to change? But by learning. China's a case in point. 25 years on a Chinese time scale, it's nothing. What is their strategic transformational goal? Is it to cover their countryside in concrete and build skyscrapers? Or is it that they now have a national life that in response to that change, the national life demands that they now dedicate millions of square miles of their countryside to national parks. Maybe that's their response. Thank you very much indeed. If you've got any questions, I'd be delighted to answer them.